I do not believe any of this conduct to be appropriate for a member of the House, but that is actually not for me to judge as a single ordinary member. Which is why it is not a motion to condemn, this is a motion to pass this matter to the Privileges Committee of this House of Commons. I beg to move. John Nicholson. Um, thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. At the heart of this issue, I believe, is accountability. What should happen to members who break the rules, and how open should our procedures be? What should the public be allowed to know? I would like to say at the outset that I am very sorry that the Speaker feels that by revealing his decision not to have a debate uh, in the Commons uh, uh, about our committee report has put him in a bad light with the public. This was never my intention. <clears throat> my intention – allow me to develop my speech and you will hear my points – my intention was merely to let the public know what had been decided. Now, I am accused of breaking a rule myself, and I would like to tell the House, if I may, the circumstances. I am a member of the Digital, Culture, Media and Sport Committee. We held a hearing with the then Culture Secretary, the member for Mid Bedfordshire, at which he claimed that a Channel 4 reality series she appeared in some years ago used actors pretending they were members of the public. She claimed that they had confessed this to her. Now, a member of the pub production team who lived on the estate concerned. Order. <coughs> it's re- I, I'm sorry the Honourable Gentleman missed my opening remarks, but it was quite clear that this does not have to be, this is not about the actions of any other member. It's not about what happened in the um, committee with any other <coughs> right honourable member there. It's about the motion before us. John Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, if I can say that there was considerable press interest in our committee's work, um, and I decided that we should send a copy of the committee report uh, to the Speaker, I thought that the time might be set aside for a debate about uh, uh, referring it to privileges. Now, the Speaker wrote back to me saying, that he did not believe the case met the threshold for debate. I recorded a video summarising the Speaker's decision, and I tweeted it. I offered no comment about the Speaker, nor did I criticise him. There was considerable public interest in it, and I soon discovered that the Speaker was angry. He believed that I should not have reported his decision. And last Wednesday, he told me in the House that he thought I had not summarised him accurately and that I should not have reported him at all. Now, it was not my intention in any way to summarise him inaccurately. Before I was elected here, I was a journalist, a reporter for Newsnight, amongst other current affairs shows. Now, I believe in open democracy, but I also believe in maintaining agreed confidentiality. It did not cross my mind that revealing the Speaker's decision on this was a matter of privilege. After all, what was I to say if journalists asked me if I had written to the Speaker? Was I to say yes? Has the Speaker responded? Has the Speaker given a ruling? Was I then to say, I am afraid I can't tell you? I did not consider that I had broken any confidence or betrayed any trust. I did not imagine that the Speaker's decision on this, a matter of importance to my constituents, could not be revealed. Moreover, I believe that I summarised the Speaker fairly, but I am in the unfortunate position of finding myself unable to prove that, since to do so I would have to release the Speaker's letter to me in its entirety, something we have established the Speaker does not believe that I should do. Now, there is a suggestion that I printed only half the letter. Can I say this is not the case? The Speaker's letter to me came as a letter through the post. There was no need for me to print it, nor did I publish it, nor did I show its contents to the camera, nor did I leak it to others. I was very open uh, in the way that I talked about it, which I hope shows that I didn't think I was behaving improperly. Now, there has also been some suggestion that the Select Committee did not wish to see this matter proceed to a privileges debate. 
This is not the case. The committee decided not to refer the member concerned as she was no longer a cabinet minister, but the committee left open the option of others doing so. Indeed, some committee members expected this would happen. I agreed with the findings of the committee. They were unanimous and cross-party. Now, the Right Honourable Member for Halton Price and Howden, who wrote to the Speaker asking for this debate, has just spoken again. I've never met the Right Honourable Member or spoken to him here, although I may have interviewed him in the past. He is not a member of the committee and has previously championed free speech. He spoke... Order. We're really not here to discuss the matters surrounding the committee itself. He needs to stick to what is in the motion. John Nicholson. Can I just say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I spoke to the chair of the committee and the clerk of the committee today. I gave them exactly the words that I was going to use just now and got their permission to use the words that I have just repeated. Entirely, I'm not entirely sure it is, up to, uh, it is up to me to make the final decision. They don't give the Honourable Gentleman permission, I do. John Nicholson. The Right Honourable Gentleman spoke last Wednesday following the Speaker's remarks from the Chair. Now, he laid into me with some vigour, using what appeared to be a pre-prepared speech. He was especially exercised by, he was especially exercised by what he saw as my breach of parliamentary etiquette. It's worth me pointing out in that context that he didn't contact me to inform me that he planned to speak about me, which, as we all know, is the Convention. I wasn't afforded the opportunity to reply last Wednesday, but before moving on to other business, the Speaker concluded, I, I think we'll leave it here for today, and I assumed that the matter had been laid to rest. However, the Right Honourable Member then took to Twitter to pursue his criticism of me complete with a video of his speech. Yes. Order. It's not for the Honourable Gentleman to be criticising the Right Honourable Gentleman who, who have moved the motion. He can speak to the motion, not outside it. So can we just stick to what uh, is the matter in hand? John Nicholson. <clears throat> I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, who on a personal level I like. Can I just give him some friendly advice? Stop digging. Put the spade down. <laughs> uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, 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 people are watching uh, this, which I'm pleased that they are. Uh, I think people will draw conclusions, having heard both sides of the argument. Yes. Can I just say to my honourable friend, I've been in this House for 21 years. I've been a member, as you know, Madam Deputy Speaker, of the House of Commons Commission for something like four years. I had absolutely no idea that you could not reveal whether you had correspondence with the Speaker or not, or summarise what that was. How on earth was my honourable gentleman supposed to know that, with me, with 21 years, service on the Commission, didn't know that? And, and can I just say, Madam Deputy Speaker, all of this just seems, and I'll ask this, my honourable friend, at, at best, just some sort of, you know, like, I, I don't know, like just some sort of mean for retribution, and at worst, institutional bullying, because that is what it's starting to feel like right now. So sorry. Order. Um, it, it's, interventions can be made. They should be brief. But I would also remind um, uh, honourable and right honourable members that if the House does decide that this goes to the Committee of Privileges, the sort of arguments can, the, can be made there. This is on a simple matter of the motion. Other arguments could be made to the Committee if the House decides that it wants to, to, it to go to the Committee. John Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I know that the Speaker has been on the receiving end of often unpleasant comments from the public since I revealed his decision. That was never my intention. I didn't use his name. I didn't link to him. I didn't post contacts for him. I am <clears throat> I'm very, I'm very sorry that a pylon has ensued. I have friends across the House. I believe in vigorous but fair debate. 
I have no time for abusive behaviour. I don't engage in it, and I deplore it. I am advised that I have breached a parliamentary rule by referring to the Speaker's letter. As I have explained, I did not knowingly do so. I would never reveal a confidence. I did not then believe that the Speaker's decision on a parliamentary matter was a secret. Uh, and it, indeed, is this not, and it's perhaps not a matter for today, but should there not be a distinction between correspondence containing confidences and correspondence on policy decisions? Has, has every, let me finish this point and I'll come to you. Has every member who has revealed a Speaker's decision by letter hitherto found themselves the subject of a parliamentary privilege debate as I am today. Although this convention appears to exist, is it not the very antithesis of open democracy? I find that many members on both sides of the House have told me privately they did not know this rule existed. I didn't know it. And I should perhaps declare an interest as uh, another member who appeared in the very same reality show which his committee uh, discussed. He has not apologised to the Speaker. Does he not think that having betrayed what was marked as private correspondence, which clearly and quite rightly aggrieved the Speaker, that if he had given an apology at the time when it was raised by the Chair last week, he would not be in this position uh, now? Why didn't he do that? Would he like to try and at least bring back some decorum by apologising profusely to the Speaker and the House for the offence that he's called now? Uh, the Honourable Gentleman says that the letter was marked private. I don't know how he knows what was on the letter. I have shown the letter to absolutely nobody. Uh, but since you challenged me, the letter was not marked private. If the letter had been marked private, I wouldn't have talked about it. Um, it it's, it's, it's a very core belief of people in my former profession that you hold confidences, that you will go to prison rather than reveal your sources. The letter was not marked private. It was about a matter of policy, about whether or not a debate could be held, and I did not think that it was confidential. Will you give way? Yes, indeed. I, I thank him for giving way. He has said uh, that he uh, uh, was aware that the Speaker had become very angry, and since the Speaker is serving all of us, and it is about decorum, is it not time that he apologises to the Speaker? And maybe that resolves a lot of things. I, I'm slightly, I want to answer that question honestly. I'm slightly, I'm slightly torn. Because, on the one hand, I am deeply sorry that the Speaker is upset. I, I don't conduct politics in a way, for those who know me, uh, that ever aims to be offensive. And I'm truly sorry that the Speaker is upset. And I'm truly sorry that I've upset the Speaker. But it would be disingenuous of me to say that I knowingly revealed this. I could not have been more open by going on camera and discussing this. I clearly wasn't trying to hide it. People in my profession, my former profession and this profession, who want to pass things into the public domain in a sleek or surreptitious way, they give it to journalists. I didn't do that. I stood up and I talked about the letter without revealing in detail its con uh, contents but summarising it. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, this place often seems hard to understand for the general public, and its procedures can appear opaque. I suspect most people will find it curious that the member who misled the Select Committee was subject to no consequences, but the member who revealed that... Order. Order. He absolutely needs to withdraw that remark. I, I, I withdraw that remark. Uh, I, however, am subject to the current debate, which I notice over the years these debates have been confined to people who have committed sometimes, or accused of committing, some of the most egregious offences. I have yet to meet a member who, who thinks this falls into that category. But I do want to conclude by saying again that it was never my intention to insult the Speaker. I don't know him well but we have only ever had friendly exchanges when meeting. I bear him absolutely no ill will. I deplore any and all online abuse 
that he has suffered. Now, <coughs> nobody, I imagine, <coughs> excuse me, I'm slightly hoarse, nobody, I imagine, is enjoying this debate, least of all me. I find interpersonal conflict stressful and unpleasant. I hope the House concludes that there was no malicious intent in anything that I did, and I apologise to the Speaker for breaching a House rule. But given the all-party nature of the committee report, I sought no party political advantage, and I hope that members here today will seek no party political advantage. My only motivation was to do what I always try to do, and that is to engage with debate and to communicate my work here with constituents and with journalists as openly and fairly as I can. Thank you. The question is on the